Uh, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to just pause for until, the, until 2023 from the indwelling life teaching. And I'm going to share. Um, it's, it's really a prophetic message. It's a prophetic message in the sense of this is what I believe the Lord is going to be doing in his people uh, what, he's, what he wants to do here at the end of the age. And, uh, just, and, it, and it also it ties into the Christmas story and the season we're in. And so in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, it says, now after, and you're familiar with this, but now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has bo been born king of the Jews? For, now, I want you to notice this. For we saw his star. I never seen that until just recently, just this week. It was his star. The Lord had a star at his first coming. The Lord had a star at his first coming. For we saw his star in the east. And we have come to worship him. Now let's go down to verse 9 and 10. And, and the Magi, after hearing the king, they went their way. And the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them. Who does that sound like? John the Baptist. His star was a forerunner pointing the wise men to Jesus Christ. I'd never seen that before. His star went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. What did the angel Gabriel tell Elizabeth is this child, talking about John the Baptist, will be, will be when his, he's born, will bring incredible joy. See, before, say at the Lord's first coming, the Lord had a star. It was a forerunner, and it pointed the wise men to where Jesus Christ was. At the Lord's second coming, the Lord also is going to have a star, the morning star, that will be a forerunner pointing the world to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so what I want to do in this message today is really unpack the, what it all means for, for the Lord to have a morning star in his people that will point to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Just like that first star was a forerunner that pointed to his first return the Lord will have a company of people in whom the morning star, Jesus Christ himself, rises up in their hearts. And they will point the world and the church to say he is coming again in his second coming. And so what I want to do just to start off here is let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 through 19. I would encourage you to just really spend some time reading 2 Peter chapter 1. It's been a passage I've been studying for, just, just been in, meditating on for, for a while now. It's just very timely. That is a very, very timely passage of Scripture. 2 Peter 1, 9, verse 16. is Peter's writing, and he's talking, and he says... We did not follow cleverly devised tells. You could say we were not following a conspiracy theory, if you want to use modern day language. We were not, we were not, this is not a conspiracy theory, us talking about Jesus Christ. He says, we were, we, when, when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's talking about the coming of Jesus Christ at the transfiguration, when they saw the glory of God and the power of God transfigure right before them, and Jesus Christ was declared the Son of God in their, in their, uh, right before them. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. I, I can't even imagine what that must have been like. I mean, just to have walked with Jesus and you go up this mountain, and then all of a sudden the Lord is transfigured and his, his clothing becomes white, 
and the light of God becomes so strong. His face is shining like the sun. And then all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah appear. You know, and Peter, who's so outspoken, says, Lord, we're going to build three tabernacles. And the Lord's basically like, Peter, shut up. I mean, if there's anyone, you know, it's okay if there's people in your lives, you need to tell them to be quiet. The Lord did. The Lord's like, Peter, be quiet. I am about my son at this moment. And, and they heard the, the utterance. I can't even imagine what that must have been like for to hear this voice out of heaven say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. And when he would receive honor and glory from God the Father, such as an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Verse 18, and we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Verse 19, so we have the, the prophetic word made more sure. What, ba what Peter was saying is this, is all of the Old Testament prophecies that pointed to the Messiah and his second coming. And I don't think they even realized at that time there would be a second coming. I think they all realized it was just one coming, but that as the revelation unfolded, they began to realize, okay, this is actually two comings, a first coming to die for the sins of the world, a second coming that he's coming to take over the world and reign as king. And, and so he's saying we have the prophetic word of the Lord made more sure. All that the prophets have spoken, Isaiah, Daniel, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Isaiah, uh, Zephaniah, all that Malachi, all that they have said, we have this prophetic word confirmed because we saw him in the glory of God. And this is, listen to what he said. To which you will do well to pay attention See, the church today does not care for end-time prophecy. We don't. The prophetic scriptures. But what Peter's saying is the prophetic scriptures actually are vital to you for the morning star to rise up in your heart. Studying the prophetic scriptures, studying the word, the second coming of Jesus Christ, and all that will take place, he says... You do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, and this is really where we're getting to, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. If you study carefully the transfiguration, I, want you, I just want to make this one point. It's, it's, it, is by, it is not by coincidence the Lord connects the rising up of the morning star with the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. The, trans the, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ was a foretaste of the Lord coming in his kingdom before he came in his kingdom. The Lord said in, in Matthew 16, there's some of you here that will not taste death until you see the Lord coming in his kingdom. And they were able to experience the, the Lord coming in his kingdom, coming in power and in glory with Moses and Elijah, which are probably the two witnesses in Revelation. They were able to get a snapshot of the Lord coming back in power and glory. And in this place, the Lord, or the, the Holy Spirit inspires Peter to write this statement. Until the day dawns. What is that day? It's the day of the Lord's appearing. It's the day of his second coming. It's the day when Jesus Christ comes back in his second coming in power and in great glory. But before that day dawns, there's another event that's going to happen. It's called the morning star rising in the hearts of God's people. See, what, what we got to understand about this is you know, sometimes we think about that the Lord's second coming is just going to be like this, this you know, it's 7.29 a.m. and it's pitch black. And then it, all of a sudden, just like the snap of a finger, it's 7.30 and it's bright light. That's not the way it's going to work. The Lord's second coming is going to be gradual. There's this gradual inbreaking of light. So 
the Lord's second coming is not just going to be the snap of a finger and all of a sudden it's bright. It's, it's dark outside. In fact, we're going, to be, we're going to be experiencing the deepest darkness the world has ever experienced. In fact, we're already beginning to experience some of that right now. As Isaiah said, that behold, deep darkness covers the earth and deep darkness to people, but the Lord is rising on you and his glory is appearing upon you. See, in the world's darkest hour, the church will enter into her finest hour. And so, and so before, but here's what we got to understand. Before, when, when it's still dark, and before day breaks, the morning star shines in the night sky. And that morning star says, a new day is coming in. And God is going to have a people in the darkest time of human history, that, that are filled with the light and the life of Jesus Christ, that are forerunners, that are heralding a new day is dawning. They are the morning star. They are carrying the morning star in their hearts. See, the morning star is actually not a star at all. It's the planet Venus. But the ancients would look at that morning star and say, when Venus would come out, when the, and I don't even know back then if they knew it was Venus, who knows. But they would say, that when that morning star comes out, we know a new day is coming. And at the end of the age, God is going to have a people in whom the morning star rises up and shines in the darkest hour of human history. See, when the church, when, when, when the world enters into the, the, their very darkest hour, the church enters into her finest hour. I'm telling you, these are the greatest times to be alive. Even if it seems as if the world has gone mad and the church is kind of going right along with it, God has a remnant that he is raising up in whom the morning star is going to rise up in fullness and we are going to shine the light of the glory of God in the darkest time in human history. That's what we're called to. That's what you're called to. We're meant to be that forerunner who prepares the way. So let's talk about eight things the morning star means. Let's look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. Is the Lord says, the Lord says that I am the root and the descendant of David. He's the root because he's God. He's the descendant because he's man. He's fully God and fully man. And the Lord says, I am the bright morning star. The Lord Jesus Christ in the darkest of seasons and times is the light, the light of the glory of God. That is who Jesus Christ is, number one. Jesus is the morning star. Number two, in Revelation 2, 26 through 28, the Lord says to the overcomers, he says, he who overcomes, he's talking to the church, he's talking to those who are born again, he says, in this context, he's talking about those who overcome Jezebel. We won't go into what all that means in this message. But he says, he who overcomes, and it really would apply to overcoming the seven things Jesus listed in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation uh, chapter 3. He who overcomes, this is not for everyone who's born again. It's those who overcome. I will give him the morning star. Now, most of the promises in Revelation 2 and 3 have an eternal aspect to them. It's an, it's an aspect that carries on in the millennial kingdom, carries on into the eternal, the eternal ages. But this particular promise to me is reserved for the end times because the morning star only has relevance when it's dark. So what the Lord is saying is he's saying that, I want you to catch this, there's never been a generation that this was relevant. Now, there's always been morning stars throughout history. There's always been those who have overcome and they were shining as bright lights in the midst of darkness all throughout history. But there's never been a generation where God's people corporately overcome and in the darkest hour of human history, they are the bright shining light that is pointing to the new day that is coming. The Messiah is coming back in great power and great glory. 
Just like Peter saw and John saw and James saw, when the Lord was transfigured and he, he, his clothing became bright light and his face was shining like the sun, he is coming back in power and in great glory. And God is going to have those who have experienced a measure of transfiguration and transformation inwardly and shine brightly in the darkest hour of human history. That's what you're called to. That's what I'm called to. It's an incredible calling. But it's only for those who overcome. It's only, it, the whole, all the church that, that, that says we're born again is not going to inherit that promise. It is the ones who overcome. It's the overcomers at the end of the age that Jesus says, I will give you the morning star. If you overcome, now what do we have to overcome? It's, it's what he talked about in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. If we overcome losing our first love, if we overcome uh, the fear of death, the fear of persecution, if we overcome false doctrine, if we overcome Jezebel, if we overcome apathy and indifference, if we overcome lukewarmness, if we overcome those seven things Jesus listed, then he says, I will give you the morning star. I will give you that morning star. I will give you that ability for Christ who is life, Christ who is light, Christ who is the overcomer, Christ who is glory, to move from your spirit into your heart. Yes. See the conditional language of, first, of 2 Peter 2? That, that, uh, that, that Christ would arise in your heart. It's not an automatic thing. You, you're, when you're born again, your spirit and the Holy Spirit become one. He dwells in your spirit. But for Christ to rise up and to possess your heart, to rise up as light... That takes your heart being prepared. That takes your heart being circumcised. But God will have a generation of overcomers that overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. And in that remnant of people, the, that the Lord himself will rise up and be the morning star in their hearts. Number three is that the morning star is Christ arising in the hearts of the overcomers. The morning star is Christ arising in the hearts of the overcomers. Just, just go back to 2 Peter. Or we'll just, just, I'll just read it. Until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Until. I just want to just focus on that. See, so when you're born again, the Spirit of God comes to dwell within your human spirit. And your spirit literally becomes one spirit with Him, grafted to the Holy Spirit. He is grafted to you. But there is an until factor. Until Christ in your spirit arises in your heart as the morning star. See, God wants that the, the church to overcome whatever it is, the, the flesh, the world, the devil, to overcome, to embrace the cross, to put self-life to death, that me that always wants to get what I want, when I want it, and how I want it, that, that we would embrace the cross, that self would die, that Christ would rise within us. Paul, Paul said that death works in us but life works in you. Death works in us, but life works in you. That He said that in, in 2 Corinthians 4.11, that the life of Jesus would be manifested in our mortal flesh. We can have, we're meant to have the actual life of Jesus Christ manifested in our mortal flesh. That is what it means to be born again. It's not a religion. It's not a theory. It's not a theology. It's not a doctrine. It's to have the actual, substantial life of Jesus Christ manifested in your mortal flesh. And the Lord is going to have a people. I just, wanted to, I just want to cast this vision of where the Lord's taken the end time church. In the words of Joel, he said, there has never been anything like it. There will never be anything like it again to the years of many generations. In other words, the time 
we're moving into when this prophetic promise is fulfilled to the overcomers. At the darkest hour of history, there will be a people in whom the light of God arises. And there has never been anything like that in history. Joel is saying there is an army that's coming. And this army, there has never been anything like this army. It is unprecedented. There is nothing that has ever been before, nothing that's ever going to be again. At the darkest hour of history, God is going to have a people who overcome. God is going to have a people in whom the morning star rises up as light, as life, as power, as victory, to, set, to, to be that voice to the nations that there is a new day coming. Jesus Christ is coming back in power and in glory, and they will herald his second coming. Number four, the morning star points to inward transfiguration and inward transformation. See, what God wants to do is he wants to transform the church inwardly. That's why we've been spending 10, we've already spent 10 weeks talking about the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, learning to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. God wants to do inside of you a deep internal work. I mean, how many of you feel like, okay, God's beginning to do a deep work, a deeper work in me? It's, it, it's, it's really, well, the other ones who aren't raising your hands, what, what's wrong? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You probably zoned out uh, just for a second. But God wants to do a deep work of transformation in us. And it's, it's so deep. It's way deeper than we think. God wants to do that inward work of transformation. But it's not just a work of transformation I believe that work of transformation is going to also be a work of transfiguration. And what I mean is that there is actually going to be the glory of God that's going to increase within his church. And I'm quoting 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that we go, as we behold the Lord in a mirror, we go from glory to glory by the Spirit. And Paul was saying that, Paul was looking at it and he was like, Moses experienced such a glory that, his, that he came off the mountain and he had to put a veil over his face because the sun was shining off his face. And Paul, if you read it, read it, 2 Corinthians 3. And Paul's like, if, if, if Moses had that kind of glory under the old covenant with tablets of stone and a ministry of condemnation and death, listen, how much more? How much more will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be with even more glory than what Moses experienced? I believe Christ rising up in your hearts as the morning star carries with it not only inward transformation, but inward transfiguration. That's why I believe he connected it to the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't, I don't believe it's gonna, we're going to shine like the sun in this age. I believe that's in the next age. But there is a measure of the glory of God rising up within us that we would be actual light, actual light, not even more than just being good people. You know, we kind of think, okay, be a light in the world. That means speak the truth and be salt and, you know, you know confront sin and, you know, show Christ and stuff like that. I believe there's actually going to be a shining forth of glory from the end time church. I don't believe it's going to be like the sun, but I believe there will be a measure, a measure of transfiguration, a measure of transformation that we're going to have the glory of God shining through us at the end of the age. That's what the end time church is called to. We're not just called to hide in the corner and wait for Jesus to come rapture us in fear and terror of the Antichrist. We're, God is raising up an overcoming army, an overcoming army who has the morning star Jesus Christ rising up within their hearts as light, as life, as victory, as glory, as power. And that's why we're going through this class, the indwelling life, because that's how you do it. It's how you do it. Now, I believe there's coming a supernatural, sovereign move of God to enhance that, but there's also right now... We don't have to wait for a sovereign move of God. We can begin to live in this now. We can begin to live in that place of inward transformation and glory right now. Number five, 
is the overcomers will shine in the darkest hour of history. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. Isaiah 60. Just, just hear the Lord speaking this over us. Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Verse 2. Behold, darkness will cover the earth. The Lord's second coming will be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Are we not experiencing that right now? It's only the beginning, unfortunately, but it's that it is a time of darkness. And it, it's very easy to be discouraged by the increase of darkness, the increase of normalizing those things God calls an abomination, those things calling good light and evil, calling evil good and uh, e good evil. Isaiah said, deep darkness, the people. See, we're, we're living in that hour when deep darkness is covering the people. We're living in this hour when Isaiah 60, verse 2, is being fulfilled. Deep darkness is covering the people. But the Lord doesn't want his church to be discouraged or disheartened or lose hope by that. We're meant to be the morning star that shines in the light of the blackness and the darkness and says the glory of God is, is here in a measure. The glory of God is coming in fullness. We're meant to be that forerunner army that shines when, when the world is at its absolute darkest moment. See, Jesus said... In Matthew 24, he said, when he said, they were asking about, okay, tell us the sign of your coming in the end of the age. The Lord said that lawlessness is going to increase. Now, the lawlessness is not like breaking the speed limit. It's not like, okay, the speed limit is 55 and you go 56. That, that's not what lawlessness means. He's talking about the law of God, the moral law of God, the law of Moses, the moral law of God that was established in the earth. He's saying, he's saying the nations are going to go off and they're going, to, they're going to break the moral law of God. In fact, in Psalms chapter 2, we see the nations raging against God. The kings of the earth, the nations are raging against God. And they're, they're saying, we don't want your word to be a bind, a, a thing that binds us in our culture. We want, we want freedom. We want to cast off your cords and your chains. They call the word of God bondage and chains. And, and so we're seeing that, aren't we not, in, 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 the, in America, where we're, we want to get rid of the, the scriptures out of culture and, the def, and what God defines as what's moral, that we say whatever's right in your own eyes is what is okay and acceptable. We're living in that day and age where the nations are raging. We don't want God's word to define and speak into culture and to say this is what the word of God says. We want to say, this is what's right in our own eyes, therefore we're going to live by it. Whatever love is, is love. Instead of realizing, no, God himself is love. Not what man says is love. God is love, and God's love has boundaries to it that are defined in his word. And so the culture is raging against God. We don't want your word to define or restrict us. We want we want to live how we want to live, whatever's right in our own eyes. That's the day and age we're living in, and we're, going to, we're moving into a time where, where what God's word clearly, clearly says is good and light, the nations say is evil and darkness. And they will celebrate it, and they will legalize it, and they will per even persecute the church for, for clinging to this word, and they'll say, that word's outdated, we've moved on in society. We're living in that day. We're living in that hour. It's going to increase. It's going to get darker. Now, I'm not saying that to discourage you. I'm saying in that darkest moment, me, you, Christ is meant to rise up in our hearts. That's why I prayed Ephesians 3 uh, during worship. He's meant to rise up in our hearts and to flood and fill, fill our hearts so much so that we are flooded and filled with God himself, the fullness of God in the fullness of time. You're meant to be 
one who has the fullness of God. Not a trickle, not a small measure, the fullness of God in you. The, the world needs it. The nations need it. The nations need you in this moment. The people you work with, your family members, whatever it is, they need you to be that light in whom Christ himself rises up as light, life, victory, glory, and power. You're meant to shine in this dark hour we live in and be the light that points to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Just remember, when the world experiences its, its darkest hour, the church is going to experience her finest hour. This is not a time to be hopeless or depressed or discouraged. I'm telling you, we're living in, just like in the first century, with the birth of Jesus Christ, with all of these prophecies that came fulfilled. And we were watching the Nativity story last night, and it's just amazing. These prophecies began to be fulfilled, and the convergence between the, end time, between the, the messianic prophecies and what happened with the shepherds and the wise men and Mary and Joseph and just these visitations of God. We're living in that same kind of hour right now where the prophecies related to his second coming are converging into something we've never, listen, in the words of Joel, there has never, ever been anything like it, and there never, ever will be anything like it again. The Lord is raising up an army. Now, that's not a just, you know, some people will hear this on the Internet and go, oh, you mean guns? No, it's a spiritual army. So God is raising up a spiritual army whose weapons are not of the flesh but are mighty through God. That brings me to number six is, is the overcomers. This overcomer army God is raising up will be a forerunner army. Just like, just like in the first coming of Jesus, there was a John the Baptist, one individual, John the Baptist, who was a forerunner. And the spirit and the power of Elijah rested on John the Baptist. And he was anointed to go before the first coming of Jesus to prepare a people for the Lord. And John the Baptist had to break out of the religious system, out of the system of Judaism, which had become such a, had become such a religion, such a, an organized religion that, that basically was excluding the move of God. John the Baptist was in line to be a priest in that system, and he had to go out into the wilderness. He had to go outside of the camp. And this God is going to have another John the Baptist, but this time it won't just be one individual. It'll be a corporate group of people, an army of messengers who will prepare the way of the Lord. And if we're going to be those messengers, if we're going to be that army, we've got to go outside of the camp. I'm quoting Hebrews 13, outside of the camp of what has become Christianity in our day, in our hour. I'm quoting Isaiah, uh, Revelation chapter 18. Come out of her, my people. We can never be a voice, of, a prophetic voice of God if we're, if we're going to be inside the camp of organized Christianity. We've got to come outside of it. Like John, he was a voice crying out in the wilderness. God is going to have an army of messengers like John the Baptist, a corporate John the Baptist, who is going to prepare the way for the Lord's second coming. And if we're still part of the religious system, if we're still, still part of what is called Christianity in our day and hour, that system that is so spread throughout the world that hardly has any measure of Christ's life in it, we've got to come out of that into the wilderness so we can be a voice to the church that Jesus is coming back. Make yourself ready. What you're hearing from many, many churches is hardly what God's speaking that's why the Lord said, many are going to come in my name and they're going to deceive many. They're not dressing up like Jesus Christ and saying, I am Jesus Christ. No, they're coming in the name of Jesus Christ, yet their teachings, their ministry, and what they're speaking and saying is deceiving people. We've got to be that voice that is in the wilderness. Amen. So let's turn to Psalms 110. Psalms 110 
I would also encourage you to read Psalms 110. It is a very important prophecy for the day and the hour we live in. And just remember as you're turning there that the Lord had his star at his first coming and his star went on before him as a forerunner to point the wise men to him. The Lord at his second coming is going to have his star, the morning star, an army of people of overcomers in whom the morning star has risen in their hearts, the light, the glory, the power, the life of Jesus Christ has so occupied their hearts that self no longer lives, but Christ lives. And this army will be a forerunner army that points the way to his second coming. Now we see here in Psalms 110, de definitely want to encourage, it's only like six or seven verses. Well, how many verses is it? Seven verses. Just want to encourage you to read this. It's very, very relevant. David's writing, he says, The Lord says to my Lord. In other words, he's saying, The Father says to the Son. That's, that's basically what that means. The Father says to the Son, Sit at my right hand. What that means is Jesus is not going to come back and return, notice the word, until. Remember I, saw, I showed you 2 Peter 1.9, until the morning star rises in your hearts, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now that doesn't mean every single enemy will be defeated, but God is going to raise up an army that's going to begin to we have this idea of the end of the age where the Antichrist is just, you know, it's part of it's true. There's, there's some truth in it where the Antichrist is going to conquer those and they're going to overcome him by their death. That is true. But I believe it's more of this idea that there's going to be this, this spiritual conflict like we see in Revelation 11 where the beast, the Antichrist, is, is rising up, but he can't touch these two witnesses, they have power. They have the, it's during the day of God's power. They have a ministry, a prophetic ministry. And they're able to do incredible signs and wonders and incredible miracles like the book of Acts, like Moses with Pharaoh. And I believe that the end of the age is God is raising up a spiritual army that will have great power. I'm not, there's a, I couldn't go too much into this because it's, it's very much in depth. But the Lord is going to stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion. And he's going to say to his people, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing here, rule in the midst of your enemies. In this day and hour we live in where God's enemies are increasing, aren't they? Where darkness is increasing, where people are becoming more and more. They, they hate the Lord. They hate Jesus Christ. They hate his word. The Lord, word of the Lord to his people in this hour is rule in the midst of your enemies. Live as an overcomer in the midst of darkness. Don't be overcome, but rule, govern. God has given you authority. Verse 3. Your people will volunteer freely. If you look at the Hebrew, it actually means will be a free will offering. Your people will be a free will offering. They will volunteer. Now notice this. I love it in the day of your power. We haven't experienced yet the day of God's power, but it's coming. I'm telling you, it's coming. There is coming a move of the Holy Spirit that's greater than the book of Acts. The book of Acts was only the early reign. There is coming the latter reign movement of the Holy Spirit. Like I'm quoting Joel chapter 2, that, bef that God is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh before the great and the terrible day of the Lord. That was always a promise reserved for the end of the age. The first century church has got a tiny down payment of it. I believe the greatest power, the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit is coming. We haven't seen it yet. It's coming. And in that day of power, God's army is going to volunteer freely. In fact, this word power in the Hebrew could also be translated army. Your people are going to volunteer freely in the day of your army, in the day of your power, in the day of your army, in the day of your power. I say it both interchangeably. I think they're both accurate. Now, if you go through and read this, you'll notice 
in, this, in verse 5, the context of when this prophecy will be fulfilled is it's called the day of God's wrath. That is in, that is, we know that's fulfilled in Revelation 6 when the, the, when the Lord breaks the sixth seal. That's when the day of God's wrath begins during the last three and a half years of this age. God will have an army in that time period that will have the greatest power that has ever been released in the earth. Greater than the book of Acts, greater than the miracles in Egypt. It'll be, the, it'll be power like we have never seen before. It won't just be in one or two individuals. It will be in an army of people that have overcome. That's meant to be me and you. That's meant to be us. In the day of God's power, there will be an overcoming army that has the morning star. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array, what that really means is in the beauty or in the splendor of holiness. See, this army of people God is raising up will have the beauty of holiness because Christ himself is living in them. Christ himself is rising up in them as the morning star. Christ himself is rising up as power, life, glory, and victory. Christ himself is rising up as light and life. And that inward transfiguration, that inward transformation will actually bring about a beauty of holiness, a beauty of splendor. They're going to radiate the life of God to a dark world enraging against Christ and his word. That's meant to be me. That's meant to be you. Now I want you to catch this. From the womb of the dawn. Okay, does anyone see a connection with 2 Peter 1.19? Compare the womb of the dawn until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. For those who are familiar with Revelation 12, I believe the womb of the dawn is this woman that gives birth to these overcomers that will have the rod of iron, this army that, that David is describing in Psalms 110 in the day of God's power. This womb of the dawn is going to give birth to an army of overcomers who receive the morning star and shine forth the morning star of Jesus Christ. This army will herald that the, there is a new day coming. Jesus Christ is coming back in power and in glory. This army in the day of God's power will do greater works than Jesus did. Jesus said, I thought it was John 14, Jesus said, greater works will you do because I go to the Father. This army in the day of God's power, I mean, God actually names this time frame we're moving into right before the second coming of Jesus Christ. He names it the day of God's power. A power unlike we have ever seen. I believe greater than the miracles did, done in the book of Acts. I believe greater than the plagues released upon Egypt through Moses. Just read Revelation 11. You see a snapshot of that in the two, in the two witnesses. A greater power, a greater release of God's power than we've ever seen before. They're going to do the greater works of Jesus. I want to be part of that. I want to be part of that. You know, I, you know, who knows, you know, who knows when exactly the timing of this is. I just want to make myself ready for it. See, God is going to have a forerunner army, a corporate John the Baptist vessel that is going to be moving in the greater works of Jesus, that's going to bring in the greatest harvest in history, that's going to prepare the bride of Jesus Christ in the, in the darkest hour of history. The Lord is raising up this army for the day of his power. 
This is what we've been called to. This is what you've been called to. We have been called to be part of this army and raise up this army. Okay, number seven. The cross and prayer are essential to the morning star arising. Okay, let's look at Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 6. I'm going to read this from the New King James Version. And we know that, that the Song of Solomon is a natural book that Solomon wrote to the Shulamite maid in his love, but it's also a metaphor and an allegory of our relationship with Jesus Christ as his bride, him, him being the bridegroom. I won't go into all that right now, but I'm just going to say in Song of Solomon 4, 6, I wanted you to see the connection here between what the bride says in, 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 Revel, in uh, Song of Solomon 4, 6. She says, until the day breaks, until the day breaks, notice the similarity between 2 Peter 1, 9, until the day dawns, until the day breaks, until the day dawns, until the day breaks. I believe by the Spirit they're saying the same thing. Until the day breaks, until the day dawns, until, the, until that day, that light of the glory of God, the bride says, and I believe this is a prophetic word for the end time church, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. In other words, in other words, we're not going to just have this automatic glory of shining like the sun that's going to go from glory to glory to glory. We're going to go from the morning star to the day breaking, to the light coming in, to the sun shining its, its strength in the next age. But the bride, the cry of the bride, the cry of the end time church is until that time comes, I am going to go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Those are the two things Two of the gifts the wise men brought Jesus at his first coming. They also brought gold because he was a king. He is a king. But it's also what the church is going to carry at the end of the age. I will go my way. I will take up my cross. The myrrh was, a, was, a, um, was a, uh, used for embalmment, used for death. And it pictures what the cross is meant to do in our lives. The cross is meant to put self-life to death. See, the morning star cannot rise up in our hearts if self is still living. If we still want what we want and how we want it done, the way we want it done, and we still want to live for ourselves, then Christ, even if you're born again, then Christ who dwells in your spirit will be suppressed, and he will not live. Maybe you have a measure, maybe you have a trickle, but if you want the fullness of Christ in this day and hour, then self-life must die. You must die. I must die. We must come into that place where the Lord puts to death selfishness, self-centeredness, selfish living, where I want to get what I want, when I want it, and how I want it done. That we move from living for ourselves to realizing I have been crucified with Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but I am not the one living. It's Christ in me who's living. So the myrrh represented death to self. The myrrh represented death, the death of the cross. The cross working so deep in your heart, in your soul. We talked about that in, in one of the sessions on Indwelling Life, the need for that self-life to die, for Christ to bring self to death, that total, absolute death to self. He must increase, said John the Baptist, and I must decrease. See, if we want Christ to arise as a morning star in our heart, we've got to decrease so Christ can increase. Let's read Song of Solomon 6, 10 as well. Song of Solomon 6, verse 10. Again, this is, I believe these are connected verses of Scripture. And I, again, I believe this is a prophetic word to the end time church. Who is this one that... I'm going to read it from the New American Standard. Who is this that grows like the dawn? Notice again. 
the dawn. When the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, there's a progressive increase of glory from the morning star to the day breaking to the light shining like the sun. From, we go from glory to glory to glory by the Spirit. Who is this that grows like the dawn? This is meant to be us. This is meant to be you, meant to be me. As beautiful as the full moon, as pure as the sun... You're meant to shine forth in the age to come like the sun in its strength. The transfiguration of Jesus Christ on that mountain, when he began to shine like the sun in his strength, is meant to be for you if you overcome. As awesome as an army with banners. It's the overcomers. See it? An army with banners. The banner that says, we have won the victory and we've staked our victory. We've staked the, the banner into the ground that says, we have overcome. We have overcome what the Lord has said to overcome. Losing our first love, lukewarmness, selfishness, apathy, indifference, false doctrine, Jezebel. We have overcome and we're putting down our banner into the ground because we have overcome. And we're growing in the glory of God like the dawn until the, sh the, the sun shines like its strength. But there is only one way for that to happen. There is only one way. It's the cross. Revelation 12.10, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and they did not love their life. That word life is the word suke, which means the soul. They did not love their self-life and their soul unto death. They loved the Lord more than they loved themselves. That's the kind of people God is raising up in this hour. We love Jesus Christ more than we even we love ourselves. That's the kind of passion we want to have. That's the kind of fire we want to burn with. We want to burn with a passion for the Lord. We love Jesus more than ourselves. And also, this, this my way to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense, the hill of frankincense, that frankincense was an ingredient used in the incense. It speaks of our ministry to the Lord, our priestly ministry to the Lord, both a ministry of devotional prayer, a ministry of worship, a ministry of intercession. But it's both this, this ministry of the cross and the ministry of, of to the Lord, this, or not the ministry of the cross, the work of the cross and the ministry to the Lord. See, your ministry is, is not first vertical. Your ministry is first or your vertical. Your ministry is first vertical before it's horizontal. Your ministry is to the Lord before it's to the people. If you ever get that out of order, you're going to get way out of balance. The bride who makes herself ready, her ministry, her primary ministry is to the Lord. And then from that ministry is to people. Now, number eight. If Jesus Christ is going to arise in our hearts as the morning star... God must do a work in our heart to prepare the way. Wouldn't you say? We've got a lot of stuff in our hearts, don't we? Selfishness, lust, jealousy, judgment, cold love, bitterness, unforgiveness, hurt, rejection, cynicism, unbelief. I mean, I could list a million different things. But for the Lord to rise up within our heart, from our spirit to our heart, and possess our heart. See, whoever lives in your heart, whoever dwells in your heart, whether self or Christ, is going to be the life source you live by. If self is, is still enthroned in your heart, by the way, if you're a born-again Christian, self can still be enthroned in your heart. You can still put your self-life back into your heart and sit there, and the Lord can remain suppressed in your spirit. But whoever is living in your heart, whoever possesses your heart, if self is in your heart, if self-life is in your heart, if self is enthroned in your heart, 
the Lord's life will be suppressed. But we've got to make Jesus Christ the absolute supreme Lord of everything. Our thoughts, our desires, our ambitions, our motives, the tiniest little things God sees. God sees everything about our heart. Who may dwell in the, in the Lord's holy place? Who may dwell in his tent? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart. Impurity in our heart. Self in our heart. Flesh in our heart. Anger in our heart. Whatever it is. It's going to defile the heart and not allow the Lord to dwell in our heart fully. See, Paul said in Romans chapter 2, verse 29... But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men but from God. Oh, how we need that circumcision of the heart, that cutting away of the heart, that cutting away of the flesh, that cutting away of everything that would hinder the life of Jesus Christ from filling and possessing us fully. Jeremiah said, break up your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart. So even though the Lord dwells in your spirit, and even though your spirit is one spirit with him, and even though your spirit is righteous and holy and Christ-like, your heart determines the measure and the amount of the release of the spirit of God within you. If self is still sitting in your heart, if the flesh is still defiling your heart with sin, self, selfish living, then we got to have that knife of God to come and cut away deeply those things in our heart that would hinder the increase of Christ. See, just like circumcision in the natural was a private and hidden thing, God's circumcision in the spirit is an inward private thing. See, the Lord knows Every single thought, every secret, every ambition, every motive, the Lord knows all of those things. And yet he, for, for, for Christ to come and tabernacle in our heart, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory. For the Lord himself to be incarnated within you and him to dwell in your heart the heart must be circumcised of those things that oppose the Lord Jesus Christ. How we need that fresh circumcision of the heart. How we need God to come deep down where no one sees but you and the Lord. So that when we stand before the holiness of God, that's why Hebrews says that without, without purity of heart, without sanctification... No one will see the Lord. I don't care how much we go to church and how much we give and how much we say amen to the message. If our hearts are not pure, we won't see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. God do a work in us. Circumcise our hearts. And so just in closing, I just want to just wrap this up, is that the first coming of Jesus, there was his star, and his star went on before the three wise men and led them to Jesus Christ. At his second coming, Jesus Christ will have his star, the morning star, an army of overcomers who have the morning star in whom Christ rises up as light, life, and glory and shines and radiates out from the inward transformation and transfiguration. God will have this army of overcomers. And so if we want to be part of that army of overcomers, then we must say yes to the work of the cross. And we must say yes again. And we must say yes again. And we must say yes again. And we must say yes every day. Paul said, I die daily. Our cross experience yesterday is not sufficient for today. What we experienced of the cross yesterday is not sufficient for today. We must die daily 
Taking up our cross is a daily thing we must do. We must say yes to the cross every single day. And we must give ourselves to that ministry, that priestly ministry to the Lord, a ministry of the Lord of worship, a ministry of the Lord of prayer, of incense. And we must say yes to that, so that living, active word of God. How does God circumcise our heart? Hebrews 4.12. The living, active word of God that comes and divides between the soul and the spirit. It separates between the soul and the spirit, and it judges the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. How God, we need that, that living, active word to judge our hearts, to say, your motive is this. Your desires are this. Your thoughts are this. How it is to see those thoughts that influence us, that we need the word to just circumcise, to cut away so that, that Christ himself could arise within us in fullness, in fullness. And so I'll just close with something I've said over and over in this message. is when the world is at its darkest hour, the church will enter into her finest hour. Now is the time and now is the day for him to increase and for us to decrease. And we just say, I just say, what Mary said, may it be done unto us according to your word. Amen. 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 Lord, we just pray right now. I just pray for us right now, Lord, that you would come, Lord, with your power. And Lord, you would prepare our hearts right now. Lord, would you do a deep work inside of us, a deep work of transformation Lord, would you do a deep work that we would say yes to the cross of Jesus Christ? Lord, that we would say yes again to the cross of Jesus Christ. That we would say yes to the death of self. Yes, Lord, that you might circumcise deep down within so that there would be nothing that would influence our hearts, nothing that would influence us that would, Lord, uh, be your, your rival, Lord, that you would have supreme Lordship in our hearts, that, Lord, you would have absolute reign in our hearts, Lord, we pray. I just say, Lord, bring your knife, bring your sword, living and active. God, expose those things in our hearts that would prevent the rising up of Jesus Christ as a morning star in our heart. Selfishness, lust, Anger, rejection, Lord, bitterness, judgment, criticism, comparisons, competition, Lord, coveting, immorality, pornography, Lord, whatever it would be, those things, Lord, that would defile the heart. I'm asking you, Lord, to come and circumcise. <clears throat> Lord, just like Simeon said to Mary, is he, he will be for the rise and fall of many, and a sword will even pierce your own heart. Lord, may you come, Jesus Christ, as the one who, from, whose sword, from whose mouth comes a two-edged sword, and would you pierce through in our, our hearts to expose our heart and our thoughts that Christ would rise in fullness. Lord, would you give us vision, I pray, Father. Would you give us vision of this army you're raising up in this hour, this army of overcomers, Lord, that will shine with the brightness of God, with the light of the glory of God as the morning star, Jesus Christ, rises up, in, Lord, in our hearts in fullness. Would you give us that vision, Lord? I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, did you have anything to share, Dad?